When we last spoke, we were sipping on the spoils of our New England IPA endeavor. There was something the mastermind behind Hetty Topper said that kept echoing through our minds. If you think you know about brewing, keep brewing for 10 years and then come talk to him. Well, John, we'll see you in 10. My name's Zach, and I love beer. We crushed our reserves from the last episode, so we're brewing our own New England IPA. But if we're going to stand a chance of brewing something delicious, we're going to need a recipe. If brewing a box is knee deep and extract is waist deep, we're going for elbows with an all-grain brew. Consisting of mostly Pilsner and Maris Otter Pale Malt, throwing in oats and wheats for added flavor and body. Should give us about this percentage and should give us about this color, if we don't mess it all up. We're using London 3 yeast and four different hops, which we'll get into a little later. Scan this QR code right here if you want to try this recipe yourself. It seems every time we hit the road, the rain follows. No flash floods this time, so we were still able to do our Canadian civic duty and stop by Tim Hortons. Coffee's free here in Canada, not by law, but because everyone's too nice to say anything. Just kidding. We paid. As the sky turned into a Bob Ross painting, we arrived at our local homebrew supplier, a fantastic mom and pop shop called Bootlegger that has been serving the homebrew community for over 25 years. They set us up with most of what we needed to get brewing and had every ingredient that a recipe called for. And there they are, Humulus Lupulus. I have no idea if that's how you pronounce it. It doesn't look like much when piled on a countertop, but this right here is the beginning. The beginning of an incredibly costly hobby that we just won't tell my wife about. We had all our ingredients, but our equipment was lacking. So we set out to visit Derek's birthplace, the hardware store. We got our hands on a burner that despite the warning on the box, was certainly powerful enough to fry a turkey. Then we hit the aisles where Derek suggested that we could save a few bucks by building our own cooling coil. And up until then, I'd never even heard of a cooling coil. But this was meant to be a learning experience, and both Dave and I were absolutely out of our comfort zones. Did I mention this whole time I was in the middle of planning my wedding? There I am, planning my wedding. Cracking open a can is the effortless conclusion of a long and intricate journey. We are borderline professionals at drinking amazing beers, but brewing is much more magical. Like any creative process, it's often a matter of timing and having the right team at your side to help create that magic. That being said, if you're gonna brew beer from scratch with zero experience, one word of advice, find a Derek. See, one thing we forgot to mention is that Derek owns his own brew pub. He'd been home brewing for years, he's an engineer who designs breweries, and is co-owner and brewer of Brewski, the pub in Montreal that you saw me working at in the last episode. Not exactly a lightweight. Step 1. Clean, rinse, repeat. Cleaning is an integral part of brewing. They say that good, clean brewing equipment creates good, clean beer. Still not sure who they are, but if it prevents our beer from catching a cold, then I'm all for it. Here's Derek building some stuff. <laughs> Step two, mash. We put the water on and had about an hour to kill, while 28 liters heated up to about 72 degrees Celsius. In the meantime, Derek willed a cooling coil into existence using a flower pot, saving us $75 and a few hours of cooling later on in the journey. Just in time for the water to be ready to steep our grains. This is where it gets exciting. The mash-in process is akin to making a huge batch of tea slowly over the course of an hour. Now all we had to do was put the finishing touches to our equipment and prepare our yeast by smacking the pack. Smack the pack, Zach. Come on, Zach, smack the pack. Come on, smack it. Dirt. Show us how it's done, please. There we go. <laughs> you know, shut up. You're back and you couldn't even smack it. <laughs> Our grains were overflowing, a slight miscalculation based on the amount of booze we were trying to achieve. There was a failed attempt at using a vegetable strainer to prop the bag up, but in the end we had to strain it using a second bucket.
This beautiful golden liquid is our wart, W-O-R-T. Sugary water that's only a few more steps away from being real beer. Our wort will be the all-you-can-eat buffet for our yeast, and yeast always pays the bill in alcohol. Of course, as always, the rain follows. Now it's time to crank it up to a full boil and eliminate any remaining unpleasantries. A little bit of math and science, and we'll get back to that later. For now, marvel in the boil. And if things weren't exciting enough, Here's where we added our first pack of hops and let it boil for an hour. But with the beauty of linear video editing, we get to skip the boring parts. You're definitely not supposed to do that, so let's just keep that between us. We added those hops and then quickly lowered to a comfortable temperature. See, yeast is very specific, and if you don't get the temperature just right, then it won't be able to perform. You want to keep your yeast cozy, and the sweet spot for London 3 is at around 20 degrees Celsius. All our hard work soaring through the air into its new home, the fermenter. And here comes the new roommate, an insatiable hunger for sweets. But fortunately, it cleans up after itself. That's right, I refuse to assume the gender of this yeast. We tucked it away for the night in a cold, dark room. But this isn't goodbye. The next day, we dry hopped, and again one week later. You can use dry hopping for any style of beer, but is of particular importance to the New England style. It's the idea of adding hops strictly for their aroma, and not for bittering, what essentially gives this style of beer its juiciness. Of course, there's more to it than that, but this part is crucial and we're not trying to sound like a Wikipedia page. We lock it up for a few more days and then finish up those mathematic calculations. The final gravity allows us to figure out what our alcohol percentage is. And we overshot our original estimates. 7.8. What a beast. Good night, sweet prince. We had to have a taste, even though it was completely flat and warm, but it was worth it. I think if you were to ask any home brewer what the worst part of brewing is, the consensus would be unanimous. Bottling sucks. It's a whole lot of cleaning and shaking and sanitizing and shaking. But lucky for us, it was a beautiful day and lens flares are incredibly camera friendly. Another crucial part of brewing is something we unfortunately lack, patience. I'd like to think it wasn't our fault. The constant aroma of citrus and mango wafting through the house was irresistible. It took everything in our power to wait even a week to bottle. Sadly, our impatience may have led to our downfall, as one week was not nearly enough time to let the beer settle. Too late, we're going for it. It didn't take too long to see the warning signs, to see the error of our ways. Because we didn't give it time to settle, there was a lot of chunk floating around in that beer. Our siphon was clogging, sucking air into some of those bottles. And oxygen is like a crowded bus to your IBS. We closed them up for another two weeks to let them carbonate, and all the while sat and contemplated where it could have gone wrong. Maybe it was the vegetable strainer. Or maybe the unsanitary pack of hops. Could it have been the impatience? Or maybe because it's just we have no idea what the hell we're doing. Anyone could brew beer, but it would seem the toughest part is consistency. And this was exactly the case with our first brew. Some bottles were perfect golden hazy hop bombs. And some were a little sludgy. But it could have been way worse. For the bottles that had it, the oxidation caused some undesirable flavors. Wet cardboard and an overwhelming caramel sweetness. But we needed more opinions. My wife, my sister-in-law, my other brother, and the general consensus was that we made beer, and it wasn't all bad. Even the neighbors, Adam and Paul, liked it. Or was that Paul and that Adam? But we needed a real expert's opinion. Let's hear it from the man himself, Bob Flanagan. Yeah, it's a nice taste. It's, a it's nice pretty good. Taste. Yeah, yeah, it's very good. 
when I'm down there and I'm with my American friends, and you know, they're, they're drinking and say, uh, uh, but, you know, to me, you, I just, you might as well drink or, or spit. When we set out to Vermont, we were searching for the ultimate prize. Once we found it, the next question was, how do we explain the phenomenal impact Hazy IPAs has had on an entire industry? Well, one way was to try and recreate that excitement ourselves back at home. And while we may have had limited success, going through the process and creating something from the ground up has given a glimpse of what's possible. It seems the haze craze is expanding. It's on its way in force, and now we need to find out what else is nearby. Because I have a feeling we're about to be surprised. Oh yeah, one person didn't like our beer. Mom. Whoa, I couldn't drink this.